Hello, and welcome to Worship with Streetsville United Church here in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. It's great to have you here. It takes a lot of work behind the scenes to make these services possible, so I would like to thank everyone who has been giving of their time, their gifts, their talents to help us come together but apart to worship. Especially a very big thank you to our tech team and to all of the musicians who have provided music for today. Before we begin our worship, it is our tradition to acknowledge the land upon which our church stands and upon whose land we now live and worship. I invite you, if you are joining us from a different part of North America, to reflect upon whose land you are living and worshiping right now. And if you don't know, I encourage you to find out. We acknowledge that our church is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, the First Peoples gathered, loved, celebrated, created, and overcame great obstacles on this land. We give thanks that we can create community here too, and we pray that the communities we create will be spaces of peace and respect for all. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship. We gather today to worship the one who created us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts, let us worship God. Let us pray. Gracious God who creates, sustains, and redeems all life, we come seeking your disturbing presence and comforting peace. We praise you for the joy of being your people. May your spirit be with us and move within us in this time of worship. Give us hearts that hear your word and minds that are open to the transforming power of your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is, We Praise You, O God. Confident of God's forgiving and redeeming love, I invite you to come with me before God together with our prayer of confession. Passionate God, you gave your Apostle Paul a whole new meaning and intensity to his life with the gift of faith through Jesus Christ, a gift you offer to us as well. 
But sometimes we squander this gift. Sometimes we are unable to respond to you as we could. Forgive us when we do not answer your call. Forgive us when the worries of this life overshadow your gift to us. Forgive us when we want to take control. Forgive us when we lacked the ability to trust. Amen. Hear these words of good news. Take comfort in the assurance that God, the creator, brings us new life, forgives us, accepts us, and guides us on our way. Live into this grace. Thanks be to God. Now we have some special music today called Awaken Me to Pray. Awaken me to pray, O my Father. When the night is long, O my Lord, hear my earnest plea. God, remember me. Awaken me to pray, O my Lord. Awaken me to pray. Oh, my Father, when I leave your side, oh, my, oh my Lord, when my footsteps, when my footsteps bring me safely, Let us pray. God, your word is a light to our path. Your word is a breath in our stillness. Your word is water to our thirst. Refresh us now and speak through your word. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Acts, the 17th chapter beginning at verse 16. Let us listen for the word of God. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to Areopagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of Aeropagus and said, Athenians, 
I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And all of this he has given as assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them, but some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysus and Aeropagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us pray. God, through me, or in spite of me, please speak to your people. Amen. So a kindergarten teacher asked the class, what is the color of apples? Most of the children answered red. A couple said green. But one student raised her hand and said white. The teacher tried to explain that apples could be red or green or even golden, but never white. But the student was adamant and finally said, look inside. Which is exactly what we find our friend Paul doing this morning as his adventures continue in Athens. He is looking inside, looking deeper to understand what it is the Athenians are looking for in their spiritual life. He is looking inside their hearts to find some common ground that will create dialogue between them so that he might share the good news that he has discovered in Jesus Christ. Today's adventure is about something Paul is well known for, his evangelizing. But he doesn't do it in a fire and brimstone, convert or else sort of way. Paul makes a point of meeting the people of Athens where they are in order that they might build a mutually respective, re respectful relationship that will lead to deeper conversation. He is meeting them where they are so that the people of Athens might recognize the Spirit of God in the midst of their day-to-day -day life, encouraging them to look a little bit deeper, to look inside and find the God that is within all we do. The Athenians were a very inquisitive and curious group of people, highly intellectual, always looking for new ideas and new understandings of the world around them. On the one hand, they are the ideal group for Paul to talk with because they are hungry to learn. On the other hand, though, they are the most difficult. They are highly educated and highly skeptical. So Paul has his work cut out for him. And he begins by drawing upon what the people already know. And what Paul knows, they are already seeking. We are told that throughout Athens, monuments and altars paid tribute to the wondrous works for different gods. 
The Athenians were very religious people. And in his travels through the city, Paul noticed an inscription on a monument that read simply, to an unknown God. They worshipped many gods, but the inscription to the unknown God, that God whose identity the Athenians are longing to find, opens the door for Paul's discussion of his understanding of the risen Christ. And so Paul begins to explain these difficult concepts of resurrection after death, of eternal life for all, and this is no easy task. We modern Christians have enough doubts and questions about this theology, but the highly logical Athenians find these ideas utterly absurd. Life after death, resurrection, these things do not happen. It cannot be explained and it goes against every law in the natural world. And with that, they give Paul a skeptical look and say, prove it. And Paul finds himself in a difficult bind, because there is no proof, per se, not the kind that the Athenians are used to, anyway. There is, in fact, little evidence available at all, only grace, only faith. But Athens, the university town of its day, requires more than faith. They want a fully rationalized argument that they can mull over and debate, something that they can seek their teeth into. And so Paul begins his argument, his analogy, with something the people might understand. The changing seasons. And as described by one of Athens' own poets, Epimenides, in this we live and move and have our being. Paul tells them that just as within the natural rhythms and cycles of nature we find our life, our food, our resources, our shelter, our very life, the same is true of God. In him we live and move and have our being. Just as the seasons change, life leads to death and death leads to new life in spring. So too does Christ offer transformation and new life to us. All that we have is from God, this God who is made fully known in Jesus Christ, this God who offers resurrection life freely to all, this God to whom they refer as unknown can be known in and through the very life we live in the creation of which we are all a part. Well, it was a start. Some of the Athenians understood and appreciated the analogy he was drawing. I imagine some had sat out in their gardens, studying their poetry and academics, and having found peace in nature at one point in their lives, were able to understand how perhaps one really could get into the heart of a loving God by looking to the beauty and mystery of creation. But there were others, many, many more, who criticized Paul and laughed at his attempt to bridge the gap between faith and academics. They just simply could not be moved. I have always been able to sympathize with Paul because he had a really hard job that day in Athens. It's no easy thing trying to persuade people to open their eyes and their hearts, trying to encourage people to have faith in something that may seem very far away and removed from their own experiences. As a preacher every Sunday, I want you to understand what it is I need to say, but much like Paul, I don't have a lot of real concrete evidence. Only stories and faith to share. And sometimes it's enough. And sometimes, depending on what you may be going through, it is not. Reason can take us only so far, and then we must rely solely on faith, a gift, grace from God to help us out. 
All any one of us can do for one another is point to things that help us to better understand the love of God in Christ. It is then up to each one of us to make the connections for ourselves, to open our eyes and our hearts, to really see God here. So this morning, this summer, I am going to point to this one little corner of the world in which I am living. I am pointing to the cycle of life, death, and rebirth that is occurring every day around us in our communities, our gardens, in the river that is running beside me, in the lake that sustains me. I am pointing to the gift of hope that comes with the planting of seeds and the birth of new babies and new animals. I am pointing to the simple miracle that all of this has been given to us in order that we may live. I am asking you to truly find God, not in the things we create, not even in this church building or the building that you are in, or your career, your house, but find God within all of those things that are dependent, we are dependent upon. Find God in the land that feeds us, in the garden that feeds the insects that pollinate our food and bring beauty to our day and nourishment to our bodies. In the valley through which our river runs and the lake that moderates our weather and provides a place for recreation for our souls as well as food and water for our bodies. Find God in this beautiful earth that we call home. And remind yourself again today that it is God upon whom we depend. It is Christ in whom we live and move and have our being. Proof of God's love and concern for humanity was all around the Athenians, and it is all around us too. We just need to be aware. We just need to remember. May you remember today and throughout this summer season those things that are truly wondrous. Venture outside your home as you are able into the holiness of God's creation and find within it not just God, but our purpose as co-creators and caregivers of this land entrusted to us. Hold in thankful prayer the tree and the flower, the sky above and the earth below. Discover the wonder of it all. Pause for a moment and be awed by the fact that you are standing here, alive and breathing amidst it all. This is holy ground, given to us through the love of God in whom we live and move and have our being. May you never doubt it. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is, Will You Come and Follow Me?
God of wisdom and new beginnings, we thank you that we can gather again together but apart to worship you, to grow in love and wisdom and to find strength and hope. We give you thanks for your message of hope and the grace that you give us. It is hard sometimes, God, to find the faith to believe, especially when the world is pressing in on us, when troubles seem too big and obstacles feel too large, and the big questions of life and death and you are so hard to wrap our heads around. It is easy to question God. It is easy to feel distanced from you when things are difficult and challenging, and it is easy to doubt. But we pray, God, that you will give us reminders every day of your presence in our lives. We pray that through the beauty of the creation, the cycles of life, death, and rebirth that we see around us all the time, that we will be able to better understand you, your relationship to us, and the promises you give us. As we pray for ourselves, for the strength of hope and faith, we pray too for those we know who are struggling and those known only to you. We pray for those who are discouraged and overwhelmed with burdens of all kinds. We pray for those standing on a precipice, not knowing what to do next, fearful for the future. We pray for those who are searching for new life amidst the changes that this pandemic time has brought. We pray for all who are struggling with finding their way forward. Fill your children with your hope and open our eyes to your enduring presence in our lives and our world. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is, In Christ There Is No East or West. Jesus' name with ready hands to bring God's kingdom into this world. Go out to bring love and justice into a world filled with hurt and pain, knowing that God is always with us. Amen. <laughs>